Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Melissa Siegel and I'm a professor of migration studies and this is a channel about all things migration. Today we're going to be looking specifically at highly skilled migrants. There are also a number of terms that are often associated with highly skilled migrants like expats or intercorporate transferees or expatriate workers or many other terms. Why should we even focus on migrants or at least highly skilled migrants? Well, that's because there's currently a global race for talent and countries are trying to attract the best and the brightest migrants because they know that having highly skilled immigrants is good for innovation and productivity in those countries. So who's actually considered a highly skilled migrant? Well, there's no universal definition of skilled or highly skilled migrants. For statistical purposes, the United Nations uses the definition of a highly skilled person being anyone that has a tertiary level of education, but there are also some problems with this definition from a statistical point of view. Now, countries themselves define highly skilled immigrants using a range of different types of visas and visa categories, and I'm going to talk about some of those today. So I'll look at defining skilled workers by their salary level, at least what some countries do. I'll also look at how some countries define skilled workers by specific talents or merits and other, other countries that use point systems that kind of bring several of these issues together. And I'll go through each of those piece by piece. We'll start by looking at the Netherlands, the country that I am currently based in. The Netherlands has a couple of ways that it defines highly skilled migrants from a visa category type. So who is typically governed by highly skilled migrant regulations? Well, people who do not have citizenship in the European Union, the European Economic Area, or Switzerland. So that means basically third country nationals in the Netherlands would be subject to a possible highly skilled migrant visa. In the Netherlands, the term here is knowledge migrant or kennis migrant. So specific conditions for highly skilled migrants include that there must be an employment contract in place already. So the migrant needs to have a job offer and they need to be rec the employer needs to be recognized by the immigration office here in the Netherlands. Then they have to the immigrant has to earn a significant income, which I will come back to, and the agreed wage is in accordance with market conditions. Now, what does sufficient income mean here? So in the Netherlands, this means you have to hit a certain salary threshold. Now, why would a country decide to use a salary threshold as a way to define highly skilled migrants? Well, that's because basically if employers are willing to pay someone a quite high salary, this is generally already associated with a lot of the other characteristics that other countries look at. So if someone is going to be paid a very high salary, they generally also have high levels of, uh, of education and also have plenty of work experience and are often working also in a shortage sector. So it's actually much more administratively efficient to define highly skilled by a salary scale than by having to look at a range of all of these other factors together. So in the Netherlands, they actually make salary categories also contingent on age. So highly skilled migrants, 30 years or older, they need to hit a gross minimum income of 4,752 euro per month. Now, highly skilled migrants under 30 years old have a different salary threshold. That is 3,484 euro per month, at least of 2021. Now, the Dutch also have a blue card scheme that falls under the European Union, which I will come back to, and there's a different salary threshold for that. And there's also the possibility of people to fall under the highly skilled migrant visa also if they're just directly out of university, and then the salary threshold is also a bit lower. 
The Netherlands also has other ways that they look at highly skilled workers, but this is their main highly skilled worker scheme. Now, another scheme that looks at skilled workers by salary is the EU blue card scheme. So this is a scheme for all of the EU countries together. So the work permit is applicable in all EU 27 member states, except Denmark and Ireland. You must prove that you have a higher professional qualification by showing a higher education qualification, such as a university degree. This is not for people who are self-employed or entrepreneurs and the annual gross salary must be high. And in this case, it has to be at least one and a half times the average national salary in that country, except there are some times when lower salary thresholds can apply. You must have also a work contract or binding job offer in, a UN, in an EU country that must be also at least for one year. So you can see that there's a general framework for the EU blue card, but how it's actually implemented in each country is slightly different because also of this specific national salary threshold, which depends also specifically on the average salary in that country. So just an ex as an example, to have an EU blue card specifically in the Netherlands, the salary threshold would be 5,567 euro per month, exclusive of any holiday allowances. The German salary threshold, on the other hand, is 67% of the annual contribution assessment ceiling for general old age pension insurance. So you can see this is a completely different way of deciding on the threshold. And it's also meant specifically for occupations that face a labor shortage. And the limit stands at 52% of the, the total amount. The Greek salary threshold is 1.5 uh, times the average gross annual remuneration in Greece based on the Greek statistical authority data. So that is looked at then at, at a specific given point in time. So you can already see the way the blue card is implemented is quite different in different countries. Now let's move on to the United States. So using the United States actually gives us the opportunity to look at different types of skilled workers that are often um, defined by kind of talent or merit. So a, a quite famous visa type of the United States for highly skilled migrants is the H-1B visa. And this is for persons in specialty occupations. So the purpose of this visa is specifically to work in a specialty occupation. It requires a higher education degree or its equivalent. It includes also fashion models of distinguished merit and ability and government-to-government -government research and development or co-production projects administered by the Department of Defense. So you can see also kind of an encompassing group here. There's also the H-1B-1 visa, which falls under the free trade agreement. So this is to work in a specialty occupation. It requires a post-secondary degree involving at least four years of study in a field of specialization. And this is now only for Chilean and Singaporean nationals. So this is a, a, a specific visa that falls under a specific tr free trade agreement. There is also the O visa, which is for individuals with extraordinary ability or achievement. This is sometimes also referred to as the Einstein visa. This is for persons with extraordinary ability or achievements in science, art, education, business, athletics, or extraordinary recognized achievements in the motion picture and television fields, or demonstrated uh, um, by sustained national or international acclaim to work in their field of expertise. This includes persons providing essential services and support of the above individual also. So basically this individual with extraordinary ability or achievements is really a catch-all for anyone who's considered extraordinary. Basically anyone who's won a world championship in any sporting event can be eligible for this visa. Now, another visa that falls under this highly skilled uh, workers visa category is the 
L visa, which is meant for intra-company transferees. And this is meant for people to work at a branch, parent, affiliate, or subsidiary of the current employer in a managerial or executive capacity or in a position requiring specialized knowledge. The individual must have been employed for, by the same employer abroad continuously for one year within the three years preceding. So this is really meant for people to go from the same company working in one country to the same company in another country. Now, within these five, uh, within these different visa categories, there are also the State Department's five employment type preferences within this highly skilled group. And these generally fall under the term E, like E1, E2, etc., etc. These are not visa types, but these are codes for work classification. And most of these classifications will be eligible for an H-1B visa, an L, or an O visa. So you have the employment first preference, which is the E1, or this is also the Einstein. This is a priority, priority worker and person of extraordinary ability. And the person will need extensive documentation of uh, consistent national global acclaim, national or global acclaim in the field of expertise. No job offer is necessary for this visa. So for instance, professors and re researchers must pursue a tenure track or a similar position if this is what they're looking for. So then you also have employment second preference, and this is for professionals holding advanced degrees and persons of exceptional ability. Here they need to have advanced degrees, either a master's or higher, or a bachelor's degree with five years of experience. Here, exceptional ability is having a degree of expertise significant above the ordinary encountered in the science, arts, or business. So you have to show in some way of being extraordinary or at least above average. Employment third preference or E3 is for skilled workers, professionals, and unskilled workers or other workers. And then you have the employment fourth preference, which is certain special immigrants. So special immigrants are generally defined as having some pre-existing um, connection with the United States, for instance. So really the, the people who fall under the highly skilled categories here would people, be people in the employment preference one and employment preference two. Now let's turn and look at the example of China. And China also has a kind of hybrid system that's both points-based and talent or merit-based. So China has piloted a point system in 2018 that places skilled visa applicants into three different tiers. There's category A, category B, and category C. So category A individuals have high-end foreign talents, and they may apply for a Z visa for standard work or an R visa for special talents. Here, this is considered high-end foreign talents are scientists, top, techn top technological talents, international entrepreneurs, and special talents that are top-notch and needed by the market and whose achievements will contribute to China's economic and social development. High-end foreign talents are free from restrictions on age, educational background, and work experience. Now, the category B group is for foreign professional talents, and these fall under the Z visa. These are talents, talents of this category should hold a bachelor's degree or above, have more than two years of relevant working experience, and are under the age of 60. There are restrictions on age, educational background, and working experience, which possibly can be eased based on individual circumstances. And finally, category C is for other foreign staff, and they also receive a Z visa. These are other foreign staff are those who meet the needs of the domestic labor market and requirements of relevant policies. Now, Placing people into this three-tier system, there is a point system. So more points are given to applicants with higher levels, um, uh, with higher level tiers. So for instance, things that are looked at are annual salary to be earned in China, educational and vocational qualifications, relevant work experience, time to be spent working in China annually, the age, 
Chinese language abilities and location of work in China. So uh, there are some special government permissions. The national government reviews individual cases prior to the visa application and places migrants into appropriate tiers without points also. So category A requires a foreign experts license from the Bureau of Foreign Exchange and categories B and C require just standard work permits. So you can already see that there are some differentiations here. Now let's turn and look at the example of the United Kingdom. So they have a visa type called a skilled worker. This was replaced, this replaced the tier two general worker visa that the UK had previously. So the requirements are that the immigrant must receive a job offer from an improved employer prior to applying. So they need to already have the job offer. They need to meet a certain number of salary requirements. This is determined on a job by job basis, but in general, it'll, it usually means that the immigrant needs to be paid at least 25,600 pounds per year, unless the going rate for that job is usually higher than this. So for example, if your salary is 27,000 per year, but the annual going rate for that job will be 30, is normally 30,000 pounds per year, then you don't meet the usual salary requirements for the visa. So starting just recently in January of 2021, the UK expanded their point system for highly skilled workers to include both EU and third country nationals, of course, because of Brexit. So from the 1st of January, 2021, EU and non-EU citizens will be tra treated equally. There is a point system now that is the predominant way for highly skilled migrants to enter the UK. The most highly skilled who can achieve the required level of points will be able to enter the UK without a job offer if they're endorsed by a relevant competent body. So there's also a preference for STEM backgrounds here. So that means that there are two different systems in the UK. There's one where you need to already have a, a, a job or a job offer. And there's another points system here where you can get a certain number of points and then you're able to come into the UK already without a job offer. This is the global talent route. Um, it was originally a non-EU program, but now has been extended to EU citizens as of the 1st of January after Brexit happened. This is currently a new pilot program that is concurrent with an employer-led system, but for skilled workers using points and without a sponsorship requirement. So now EU citizens must grow through the point system that previously only applied to third country nationals. EU citizens, however, may now pursue the global talent route previously only offered to third country nationals. Now, to give you an example of what some of these points categories looks like, so you need at least 70 points to be considered for this scheme. Um, you, uh, a job offer by an approved sponsor would already give you points job in an appropriate, at an appropriate skill level, if the person speaks English at a required level, um, if there are certain salary thresholds above a certain amount, then you also receive more points. If the person also has a job in a shortage sector, they receive more points. And education qualifications also give more points. So the higher the education level, the more the points. So you can also see here that even in the scheme where you need a job, there are still points to help you get the visa. Now, New Zealand is a country that's also famous for having a point system. The country though offers a variety of visas for skilled workers. There is the talent visa, the talent work visa, there's the long-term skilled shortage list work visa, and there's the essential skills work visa. And next to that then, there's also a point system, which is used in cases where a, work, where a work visa can lead to possibly also residency. So 
Let's first look at the talent work visa, which also requires an accredited employer. This gives a permanent residency possibility after two years. This is a visa for people who are looking for a pathway to live in New Zealand and who have a skill that's needed by, by a New Zealand accredited employer. So this is really linked to a specific employer. The long-term skill shortage visa also gives long-term or permanent residency after two years. This visa offers a pathway to New Zealand residents and to apply, a person will need to have the specific work experience qualifications and occupational registration to work in an occupation in their long-term skill shortage list and an offer for work in that occupation. So both of these visas require already um, a job offer to be able to have access to these visas. The essential skills work visas is if you've been offered a full-time job and have the necessary qualifications and experience to work in that job, you can apply for a temporary visa to work in New Zealand. Your employer must have checked if any New Zealanders were able to do the work before offering the job. So this is really kind of the third tier of the different visas in this category where you need a job offer. Now the point system for in New Zealand does not require a job offer and you need a minimum of a, a minimum of 100 points are required to for visa eligibility. And there are a number of different components that this makes up. You have things like age, um, a skilled employment type, qualifications, work experience, and uh, um, English ability, and even partners' English abilities. There are a whole number of range of ways that you can also receive points that would give you access to New Zealand and to New Zealand's labor market without having to have a formal job. Now, on a regional and global governance level, there's no universal definition of skilled and highly skilled migrants. Many international definitions classify skill by tertiary or university level education qualifications. So, in, so this is what the global data will reflect even if actual migrant visa types are labeled skilled. This means that countries individually create skilled definitions when using visas or residence permits for migrants. So here, no country has necessarily the same definition of who qualifies for a skilled migrant visa. Skilled migrants are granted visas based on one or a combination of salary, talent, merit, and possible points, which again are a combination of a number of factors, often language abilities, age, work experience, work duration, education, salary, and more. So many countries do not use just one metric to, to define highly skilled migrants, or at least to allow highly skilled migrants to come into the country. In this video, we discussed countries like the UK, China, and the Netherlands that employ more than one method. So point systems, salary systems, and talent or merit schemes. Ultimately, the classification of skilled migrants is neither standard nor consistent, but they're subject to the whims of each individual country. So I hope this video was helpful for you. It gave you a bit of an understanding of how the term highly skilled migrant is used and how countries themselves define highly skilled migrants by different visa types. If you like this video, please like it, you know, give it that thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and feel free to share this video around. Also give us a comment, ask questions if you have any, and I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.